but we don't think about the value of money and what's going to happen in terms of the printing of that value of the money and how to diversify it well. So I think those are the things that have to be atten paid attention to um, in much as they were important things in years prior to 1945. We're in a new paradigm. Ray Dalio is one of the few wildly successful investors who many look to in times like these. In the past month, the growing uncertainty around the pandemic, interest rates, unemployment and other economic factors have flooded the markets with volatility. So it is completely natural to feel worried about your money and your investment portfolio and to wonder and question how you should be positioning your portfolio, not only to protect your wealth during these uncertain times, but also how you you can set up your investments to grow your wealth as the global economy recovers from a terrible past 12 months. Today, I have one of Ray Dalio's latest interviews where he spoke at a Goldman Sachs conference and provided us retail investors with some guidance on how to manage our personal portfolios in 2021. So sit back and relax. And if you do get some value out of this video, I would very much appreciate it if you could take the two seconds to go below the video and hit the like button. These videos take a long time to put together. And if you just do that simple task of hitting that like button, it really does help me out a ton. But with that said, let's jump into the first clip. If you could just start by diving into the first issue and addressing where are we in the debt cycle? I experienced through my lifetime uh, surprises about things that never happened in my lifetime before, but happened many times in history before. And um, uh, the three forces that we're talking about, which is um, there is a long-term debt cycle, um, which we'll get into um, the, the large wealth and uh, political gaps that go with it, and the rise of a great power to challenge existing great power, happened in the 1930 to 45 period and happened many times before, and are the big drivers, not just of the economic environment, but of, of the whole environment. So let me start with the, the debt cycle. Um, um, there are, you know, in 1945, we began a new world order. 1944, we created a new monetary system, the Bretton Woods monetary system. And then <clears throat> we created that new world order. And that created a bull markets and stocks and an American world order for the most part. There's a cycle um, that we're used to in which um, whenever you have a economic downturn, the central bank hits the uh, gas and can create debt expansion, and that produces an increase in demand. And that happens in three phases at the cycle. Normally, it's interest rates. Um, you lower interest rates and the economy turns up. But when you hit zero interest rates, uh, which happened in 1932, debt crisis, 1932, we hit zero interest rates. Um, then you go to the second type of monetary policy in which central banks print money and buy financial assets to add liquidity. And those purchases, those sellers of bonds who get the cash, go out and they buy other financial assets and we have the process going through. And that's the second type of monetary policy. So the only two times that that happened was uh, 2008 to 9, 1929 to 1932, zero interest rates, print money, monetization. That'll carry you so far. And then um, there's what I call monetary policy three, which means that um, that money does not trickle down to the population and go all the places that it's needed to go. And that monetary policy means that there has to be the um, what we're seeing now in monetary policy. In other words, the coordination between fiscal and monetary policy so that the central bank is buying assets of a different sort, a wide range of, for a wide range of assets producing liquidity, and also having the um, effect of buying government debt and monetizing it. And that's the late cycle of an, of an expansion. That's what's driving the markets now. That's what's driving the economy now. Um, for example, um, today, the Federal Reserve and the, the government is creating the liquidity that we're seeing in the markets. And it has big implications for the value of money. What is the value of money? Where does money go? Cash is going to be a poor investment, and so it goes elsewhere. So that's the character of the environment, um, which means 
that if you look at the returns of asset classes um, and you take cash, isn't it an interesting world when you have zero or negative interest rates? And um, then there's the desire to create a spread in that um, so the short term rates are long, lower than long term rates. And there's and then the, when there's so much liquidity, it is the central bank that is making that market. So when we look at the market today, um, the, it needs the storehold of wealth and you see it reflected in all asset classes. So that's the main driver. And it also has very big geopolitical implications. Because as we come into this environment, um, where uh, we have the second influence, the wealth gap, the political gap, it um, means that the distinction of how money and the bills are going to be divided and how that uh, will affect tax policy and the like will matter a lot. In this first clip, Ray Dalio goes on to explain his classic theory about the three types of monetary policy, which are the lowering of interest rates, the second being the printing of money and buying financial assets, and then finally the printing of even more money to service physical stimulus in the economy. And I've covered these three types of monetary policy in a previous Ray Dalio video. It's something that he tends to bring up in pretty much every interview that he has done in the last couple of years. So I'll leave a link to that interview down below if you want to see a full explanation of each of those stages and which periods of times those uh, types of monetary policy have been used. But moving on, I won't spend too much time going through that in this video. But essentially, Dalio is arguing that we are currently operating under monetary policy policy three, whereby the Federal Reserve is printing a ton of money and buying financial assets under monetary policy two. But at the same time, we have a US government that is spending trillions of dollars on fiscal stimulus, getting stimulus to individuals and businesses that are suffering through the pandemic that we've seen over the past 12 months. And of course, all of this spending means that the US government is running up a massive deficit. They are spending far more than the tax revenue they are generating from taxing the population. There is no way that they're covering this multi-trillion dollar stimulus package that's been, or multiple packages that have been going out over the past 12 months uh, with tax revenue. So they have to use debt in order to do so. So the US government issues debt and the Federal Reserve comes along. They print money and they buy that debt, basically handing money to the US government, basically printing money, creating money out of thin air and handing it to the US government to then provide stimulus to individuals and businesses. And this kind of money printing and spending through fiscal and monetary policy has a significant consequence on the valuation of the US dollar. So in this next clip, Ray Dalio goes on to explain what he thinks the current monetary and fiscal policy, what kind of effect that will have on the US dollar over the next decade? Well, on the first point, uh, I think it's very much like the 1930s, which means when there's, uh, it doesn't produce immediately uh, a general level of inflation. It negates deflationary pressures. And what it does is it produces currency depreciations over a period of time. In the 1930s, all currencies in the early 30s uh, depreciated in relationship at that time in relationship to gold. And so what we see is the same kind of thing happening without a general level of inflation, but not just gold. It goes into other storeholds of wealth and stocks is um, an important, uh, particularly certain types of stocks it goes into um, at the very much the same as 1933 In 1933, March of 1933. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt severed the connection with gold, printed money, um, and made money available. And that was the exact bottom in the stock market. Very simple, similar to April 9th when uh, the F Federal Reserve and the Treasury uh, did the same thing. So that goes into other assets such as um, uh, stocks and so on and creates a, re uh, a reflation. It is necessary to be done because the consequences of not doing it are um, unacceptable. The wealth gap and so on, uh, you refer to that. We're in a situation where every individual, every company, every government um, has a certain amount of revenue, a certain amount of expenses, and a certain balance sheet. And when the revenue goes down and uh, to be low or inadequate relative to 
um, the expenses and there's not an adequate balance sheet, then defaults and restructurings take place. That's true for the population as a whole, and that's true for a number of businesses, hence the policies that we're seeing. What, what has been true in history is that when you have um, an economic downturn, that's a serious economic downturn, and less effective monetary policies at that same time, and you have a large wealth and values gap and political gaps, you have, tend to have fighting, internal conflict. And so rising internal conflict about how to divide the wealth pie um, is very, very normal historically. And so that's the dynamic, um, I think, that we're now seeing that will become manifest in t changes in tax policy and so on. Much like the 1930s, Ray Dalio thinks there will be no immediate inflation. So rather than cash being devalued through an increase in the price of products and services, which would be resulting in an increase in the inflation rate, cash instead is devalued relative to other storeholds of value. And he names things such as gold, and stocks and how that looks is basically if you were 100% in cash from the bottom of the pandemic last year then there has been very little inflation so in fact there was actually a significant amount of deflation so in terms of the cash itself relative to products and services uh, there really hasn't been any inflationary pressure there but relative to stocks you are your portfolio would be far worse off if you were 100% in cash compared to if you were 100% invested in the stock market. In fact, uh, if you pick a random basket of stocks, then you may have a portfolio that is 30 to 50% lower because you sat in cash. So while there has not been inflation, relative to other assets you could have held, you the cash has been devalued. I think the question that's on the minds of so many people is how should people invest and what is the correct asset allocation for this sort of environment? The most important, the investment environment going forward will be very different from the environment of the past. I mean, think about it as a zero um, and low, very low returning asset uh, environment because the liquidity uh, that's in the market is driving the excess returns of all markets down to be low in relationship to the very low cash rate. So negative real returns, not good for cash and so on. The most important thing is to know how to diversify well. And what I mean by that is to go beyond um, the, the, just the traditional 60-40 stock bond mix or even the same countries um, and to broaden that diversification. To include in that portfolio assets that might um, um, seem um, unusual, to include some gold, to include inflation index bonds, to, to think about the currency exposure, to think about safety as different. Most people think that cash is safe. Cash is the least safe investment. It just doesn't have the same volatility to it, but it has, um, um, because they're producing so much cash, it has a negative real return. Um, it's a tax um, that may be 2% a year, you lose money in terms of cash. So you have to think about risk differently and you have to diversify best. That's the most important thing, to have a well-diversified portfolio. It's so, the uncertainties that we have today are so great in terms of all the things I mentioned, the tax policies, the geopolitical, certainly we must experience it with the virus. You know, will the next wave come back and how will it be there? Diversification can be achieved without reducing your expected returns because of the way that nature, um, asset classes are priced. And then when if you're going to take tactical bets from those then those tactical bets, alpha on top of that strategic, well-diversified portfolio, should have highly diversified uh, bets um, deviated. Liquidity is going to be more important than before uh, because things change in unexpected ways. Look at how, um, in many of the cases, the businesses that you, one would have thought was a good business, and let's say you're in private equity, and, and that you're with that company. And so the restructuring, the ability to rebalance and diversify and to make and to be cautious about making a highly diversified uh, set of bets um, is, I think, the, uh, the future. But thinking even of asset classes, thinking about the value of money, 
You know, we look at asset classes um, and we say, oh, do I want my money to be in stocks and which stocks? Um, but we don't think about stocks, bonds. We think about those traditional asset classes. But we don't think about the value of money and what's going to happen in terms of the printing of that value of the money and how to diversify is it well. So I think those are the things that have to be att paid attention to um, in much as they were important things in years prior to 1945. We're in a new paradigm. Ray Dalio says the most important thing for a retail investor to understand if you're investing in the markets in 2021 is to know how to diversify well. Going beyond just the 60-40 stocks bond portfolio that has been kind of the go-to for such a long period of time. He thinks you should go far beyond that. Different asset classes, getting some property, whether that's through REITs or buying physical property, some commodities, having some gold, investments in different currencies, bonds. He thinks you should try and capture a wide diversification among a, a bunch of different asset classes in different countries, in different currencies, and that sort of thing in order to protect yourself and get a little piece of everything so that no matter where the money flows from one place to another, you will have exposure to those assets. Personally, I think if you're just getting started, rather than being overwhelmed by the idea of having to invest money in different currencies and different uh, countries and different asset classes, I think if you're just getting started for the first time approaching the markets or you have a really small portfolio, at the very least, get some diversity in terms of the stock market. So investing in a broad index fund in the US or a global index or maybe an emerging markets index plus the US market or the Australian market, get some diversity in stocks and that can be your entryway or your door opening into starting to build a diverse portfolio. And then over time, you can start to learn more about these different asset classes and investing in different countries so you can build that diversification over the long term of having a portfolio of different asset classes exposed to different currencies so that you can collect more of an average of all of the different types of store of values that you can hold over the long term. But I hope you guys enjoyed today's video and got some value out of it. I'll leave a link to the full interview if you're interested in checking out the full thing down there. And as I said at the beginning, these videos take a long time to put together. So I would very much appreciate it if you could just take the two seconds to leave a like on the video. Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below if you're interested. And of course, if you want to hit subscribe, you can. And that way you will get up to date when I am posting new videos. I've been doing a lot of these types of videos recently. So if you're enjoying these, go check out the couple of Charlie Munger videos that I've done over the past week. Uh, but with all of that said, I hope you guys uh, enjoyed today's video and I'll see you guys in the next video.